Good afternoon, everyone. And we have all come to know that this pandemic has been, has been challenging. And it has posed some unique challenges on communities, which includes the indigenous communities throughout Newfoundland and Labrador. And since the beginning of this public health crisis, we have been working very closely with those communities, with the indigenous groups and organizations to ensure that the safety and well-being of, the, uh, of their communities. The collaborative engagement go continues to strengthen the working relationships as we look forward, and we will look forward to continuing to work. Matter of fact, uh, later this week, I will be speaking to many of those leaders again. As Premier of the province and as Minister for Labrador Affairs, I would be, it would be remiss for me today if I did not take this moment to recognize the first anniversary of the release and the final report of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. It took a lot of courage uh, for the families and the survivors to relive what was tragic losses during the inquiry. This can never be understated. Violence in any form will not be tolerated. And I want to thank particularly the elders, the knowledge keepers and experts who shared their insights of their lived experiences and they informed us then and they will continue to guide us now. We all know that it is by working together with the wisdom and the traditional knowledge of our indigenous peoples that we will be able to advance reconciliation and the national inquiries call for justice. I will now turn it over to Dr. Fitzgerald for today's update. Thank you, Premier. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Since the media advisory yesterday, we have no new positive cases and the total number of cases in our province remains at 261. One person is in hospital due to the virus and 256 people have now recovered. In total, we have tested 12,619 people. For weeks now, we have done exceptionally well in keeping the number of new COVID cases in our province to a minimum, and I'm grateful for your, the dedication, bravery, and single-minded determination you have each shown to help keep your, keep your loved ones, yourselves, and the most vulnerable members of our society safe during this pandemic. I truly hope you realize the significance of your actions as they have undoubtedly gotten us to where we are today. If all goes well for the next few days and the number of new cases remains low, on Monday we will be moving to alert level three. This is another significant landmark in our plan for living with COVID-19 and it is thanks to your every effort that we are ready to enter this next level. As we transition into this new phase, adhering to our public health orders in place and practicing our own personal preventative me measures will be more important than ever because as things reopen and more people begin move, moving about, there is more potential uh, for contact with others. We must continue uh, to stay at home unless it is necessary to go out, um, especially if you're unwell. Keep a safe physical distance from others in the workplaces and public spaces. Practice proper cough and sneeze etiquette and good hand hygiene. I can't cannot overemphasize enough the power of these simple actions have against COVID-19. However, when in public and physical distancing cannot be maintained, it is recommended that you wear a non-medical or cloth mask. This additional protective measure will help to further ensure our success in living with COVID-19. Just as we moved carefully and with caution through alert level four, the same will be required for alert level three. We know this virus will be with us for a while, so we must remain vigilant as we gradually resume additional activities and business operations in this next phase of our COVID-19 plan. So beginning on Monday, Alert Level 3 will allow the resumption of the following activities while maintaining certain public health orders to help mitigate risk. Gatherings at funerals, burials and weddings can be expanded to 20 people as long as physical distancing can be maintained. Campsites are permitted to open for limited overnight camping with restrictions. Summer day camps can operate with restrictions. Medium risk outdoor recreational activities can resume, but spectators must maintain physical distancing. Outdoor pools can operate with a limited number of people. Outdoor activities, including walking, hiking, or bike riding are encouraged as long as physical distancing can be maintained and you're not required to self-isolate for any reason. 
playground equipment in municipal parks is not to be used. And gym and fitness facilities, yoga studios, tennis and squash facilities, arenas, dance studios, and performance spaces will remain closed. Private health care clinics can reopen in accordance with guidelines. Orders related to long-term care, personal care homes, and assisted living facilities will remain in place. Retail stores, including those in shopping malls, will be able to reopen with restrictions. And they are, retail stores are permitted to resume selling scratch and break open lot lotto tickets in store. Personal service establishments, including spas, aesthetic services, hair salons, body piercing, and tattooing and tanning salons can reopen in accordance with guidelines. And daycare operations will be further expanded. Restaurants will be able to reopen at reduced occupancy and buffets remain prohibited. Bars, lounges, and cinemas will remain closed. For more information related to our provincial COVID-19 alert system, including a detailed summary of public health guidance for all alert levels, please visit gov.nl.ca slash COVID-19. Every decision made by public health is weighed carefully and thoughtfully, and ensuring your protection and that, and that of your loved ones remains our top priority. We will continue to provide you with the guidance based on the best available evidence. While COVID-19 will be with us for the foreseeable future, this does not mean our lives should remain on hold or that we can't participate in daily activities and social connection with, our, with those we hold dear. In fact, as we move forward, I encourage you to find happiness and contentment in doing the things you enjoy, but just please do it safely. As a recap, for those who may have just joined, we have no new cases since yesterday's media advisory and the total number of cases in our province remains at 261. This pandemic has without a doubt challenged us and tested our resolve, but it has also provided valuable learnings about ourselves and about each other. It has shown us that progress often comes through in small steps, that individually we are capable of great things and collectively we have boundless potential. Let us continue to build on this and move forward with optimism and action. We will get through it. We have already come so far. So hold fast, Newfoundland and Labrador. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald. And we see another day, as she's mentioned, no new cases in Newfoundland and Labrador. And as Minister Hagee always says, this is zeros are good in this particular case. And last week, just a reminder that uh, Dr. Fitzgerald allowed and suggested that we can actually expand our bubble to an extra six people. And just a reminder, this is about six people that you consider close to you. And in some cases, these are the people that support and comfort you. So uh, as you do this, continue to make sure that you're responsible and within your efforts and you do it with caution. It's important now that we keep the momentum and the good work going so we can comfortably move to alert level three next week. Uh, we are close also to hitting the three month mark since the pandemic started and we know this, the havoc that this has created on our country, our province and indeed all around the world. Uh, it's been challenging. It's been challenging for many families and I said before in those briefings that change is the only constant that we have in life. There's a lot of truth in that statement. Change can be good in many ways, uh, but we also know that it's not always easy to adapt to change. It can be stressful and it can be difficult to figure things out. Sometimes it takes time, but we all know that it takes patience. Change means that we can't go back to the way things were. We must continue to move forward to learn and adjust in what is the new normal. We must continue moving forward in our plan, life with COVID. During this pandemic, we have been putting some social and economic supports in place for you and your families. But we have to remember that these decisions that we make must be balanced. We understand that additional demands and pressures on individuals, on businesses, the industries, or parents and guardians during the pandemic. It hasn't been easy and we commend you for your efforts, your strength, your patience as we work through this together. We also commend employers who have been accommodating their staff with work from home arrangements. The thing is, it, it's not always easy to balance the increased pre pressures of working in those unfamiliar, circ unfamiliar circumstances. Often with added demands on your time, productivity, coupled with trying to care and teach and entertain your children. And in some cases, there are two parents or guardians trying to balance this, and in many, many cases, there's just one. 
So I recognize the stress that, stress that many people in this situation are feeling. I also recognize and respect the adaptability and the efforts that you are making to accommodate the needs and the pressures that you're facing during this period. When we entered into level four three weeks ago, it eased some restrictions in areas like child care services. It went from only allowing children of essential workers to a capacity of 50%. And as Dr. Fitzgerald just said, some of the changes that will be coming next week under alert level three, uh, we'll see moving, and we'll see this moving there on Monday. You will then see further easing of restrictions where child care capacity will increase from the 50% currently to 70%. This means that gradually families will be able to avail of child care services again. And we're working day in and day out to guide you through this pandemic. We've made decisions, and they weren't always easy, they weren't always perfect, but decisions that were made for the protection of you and your loved ones. We took a balanced approach. As we have worked together through the past 11 weeks, let's continue to work together as we move towards our plan implementing life with COVID. This plan will introduce us and we will work together in the new normal. We have had an amazing public health team and public service who have been working extremely hard to support you in every way we can. And once again, I want to remind everyone about the great work that the All Party Committee is doing and continue to do every morning. We meet to discuss the issues and, and things that matter to you. Next week, we will be back in the House of Assembly to move to more important, uh, to important legislation to even further support you during this time and into the future. Legislation that will complement uh, the many supports that we've already put in place. Uh, today, supports like the $30 million residential construction rebate that was announced this morning by Minister Osborne. Uh, Minister Osborne was joined by Curtis Mercer of the Canadian Home Builders Association. Uh, today, they announced a rebate that will be available to home, for home renovations and for new home construction. It's going to provide rebates up to a maximum of $10,000 for work completed by a registered contractor. So whether it's families planning to build a new home or a retiree looking to renovate, this program will help, will help Newfoundlanders and Labradorians build for their future. So it's, uh, if you spend $40,000, you'll get $10,000 back into a rebate. We know that the construction industry in our province is one that has been uh, affected by COVID-19 and it has a significant impact on our economy. The rebate is intended that I've just mentioned to stimulate the economy and help create employment through new home construction and renovations. So all the work that we're doing with our all-party our all-party joint committee, our MHAs, our ministers and our departments is to help you and your families. And that is how these programs, like the renovation rebate that I've just mentioned, this is how they get created. So we are introducing new supports on top of enhancing what we already have in place. There's been some great programs that have been consistently around for many years, and we're looking for ways that we continue to support those, and in some cases, even enhance those. So really what it comes down to is uh, what the work we're doing is for you, supporting you through this pandemic, and towards that new normal. Uh, that is where we will see positive change. It doesn't work unless we are all in. So I thank you, uh, thank you for listening again today. I will now pass it over to the Minister for today's comments. Thank you very much, uh, Premier. And again, zero is, uh, as uh, we've just said, a, a great number and it's uh, a straight line uh, for uh, five or six days now, which is a testament to the uh, the diligence of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. Uh, over the course of the last couple of weeks, uh, the regional health authorities have been slowly increasing the level of planned procedures, scheduled procedures that they can undertake. And this work will continue uh, until we get to a stage where uh, it will be business uh, as the new normal permits. Uh, our current challenge is still around the availability of PPE and making sure that we have sufficient uh, to safely um, run the service that we, we run. So it's important to protect our staff uh, and visitors uh, who are availing of, of services. As part of this, um, 
all the regional health authorities will now expand their COVID testing uh, for individuals who are not only being admitted, but also for those who would uh, be undergoing outpatient, uh, what are called aerosol-generating procedures. So that would be things like uh, stomach and, and upper GI endoscopy and, and bronchoscopy. Um, don't feel that uh, when you get your appointment, you need to ring 811 to organize this. This will be organized for you through the regional health authority. Um, they will organize both the test prior to your attendance, uh, as well as the appointment for whatever the procedure is. Uh, so uh, that will all be taken care of. These plans have been made pretty carefully. They're consistent across the regional health authorities, bearing in mind the slightly different level of service each would uh, provide. Uh, we're already halfway back uh, to, uh, to the levels that we saw this time last year, uh, and certainly we'll get to that landmark without any difficulty, I think, across the system if PPE supplies hold out, and so far they have. Um, Dr. Fitzgerald has mentioned masks, and I think it's useful just to repeat uh, that for the general public, um, social um, uh, connectivity we've stressed, but physical distancing uh, is the key here. Uh, if you can't, however, because of where you may be going next week as level three uh, comes around, all being well, then cloth masks, are a protection. They're a protection for everybody else. It's something you can do as a responsible Newfoundlander and Labradorian to help protect somebody else. Um, Dr. Fitzgerald has alluded to a wide range of things that uh, will likely, all being well, open up uh, on Monday. Uh, what this means now is Newfoundlanders and Labradorians have reason to exercise discretion in travel. It's not just essential travel anymore. So there will be campgrounds available, uh, outdoor pools, uh, restaurants at limited capacity, uh, and of course, the the hospitality for which Newfoundland and Labrador is rightly famous, and an opportunity for families to uh, to get a bit of uh, me time, as it were, uh, and, and recreation uh, out around Bonavista or Baybert or on the south coast or wherever you you choose to go. But that is discretion, uh, and I think people need to be aware that whatever you do in that way you need to be conscious of physical distancing and masks as a backup. We're nowhere near ready for large gatherings, even though Dr. Fitzgerald's proposal and plan would allow for larger groups uh, over the coming week. Um, we won't see, I think, in short order, any possibility of return to much larger gatherings than, than um, double digits. So Newfoundland and Labrador, keep your distance. Uh, that's the key. If you can't, a cloth mask, um, uh, well uh, made and, and fitted, uh, ideally with a little nose piece. If you're like me and wear glasses, it will help you not fogging up and walking into things. Um, so the other key message which is out there, which Dr. Fitzgerald made, was stay at home if you're not well. This is still a time where colds and sniffles should not be dismissed. And if you do have any of the symptoms listed, you should call 811. Our isolation from each other physically has worked well for, uh, for us as a province, and we need to bear that in mind. That is now going to have to be part and parcel of how we operate as Newfoundlanders and Labradorians to do it safely. So um, well done. Uh, as Dr. Fitzgerald says, hold fast. Uh, and uh, with that, I'll turn it back to you, Premier. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister Heggie. And I will now turn it over to the media for today's questions. Thank you, Premier. For the benefit of our speakers, we have six reporters registered for today's call. Each reporter will have the opportunity to ask two questions and one follow-up. We suggest that you not ask rumor-based questions. The purpose of these briefings is to address COVID-19 issues. All other government-related issues should be directed to the appropriate department or agency for response. Reporters will ask questions in the order they registered for today's call. Please do not press star 1 until your name has been called. Following this, should time permit, there will be an opportunity for single questions. Our first questions today are from Peter Jackson of The Telegram. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, well, uh, as everyone knows, there's a new uh, possible class action suit being launched uh, on the travel ban. I'm wondering uh, if the province is not if considering backing down on it or 
if it is in the plan at some point to reverse that travel ban anyway. Well, we're under a public health state of emergency, Peter, right now, and this is one of the reasons why this travel ban was put in place was, you know, the uh, the exposure to a traveler bringing a case of COVID, a positive case of COVID into our province. So this was one of the uh, measures that was put in place and the recommendation of public health. So right now, uh, as far as I know, that the province has not been served. Uh, there, you know, the the papers about this particular lawsuit, but you know, I also know that you know, the from a public health and justice and public safety perspective, you know, they're prepared to enter a response and uh, to this. But really, this was put in place to protect Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, not about just shutting people out, but this was a public health measure, understanding the the impact of bringing positive cases to Newfoundland and Labrador. It's been very difficult as a province, as you know, the minister just said. Newfoundland and Labrador is one that's known for its hospitality, known for its friendliness, and difficult decisions to be made. But it was made from a public health uh, and safety measure to protect Newfoundlanders and Labradorians from traveler-induced uh, positive cases of COVID. Okay. Um, I'm wondering last night, uh, or last week, there's some suggestion that restrictions might be uh, relaxed to some extent with long-term and personal care homes. Is that still under consideration? Um, yes. So. Uh, yeah. oh. so, sorry, Janice, go ahead. Uh, Got to yes. stop doing that. <laughs> um, we have had some discussions with regard to uh, visitation in um, long-term care and personal care homes. We know that this is uh, something that uh, is of uh, great concern to a lot of people, uh, including residents of these homes and their families. Um, and uh, we realize the importance of uh, visits um, to the mental health of all people involved. So uh, this is something that we are looking into. We recognize the importance of it. We're trying to do it as safely as we can and to strike a balance, and we will have more information about that in the coming days. Okay. Uh, and the um, my last question, uh, sort of related to the first, we're talking about people coming in the airport, and we have heard many times before that testing everyone at the airport, even though it's you know only only about a 200 people a, a day, would prove ineffective. So why why is testing everyone like entering a hospital considered an effective tool? Um, so we're, the testing for pre-procedures that some of these procedures can cause uh, aerosol generation and so that puts people at higher risk and uh, certainly, you know, unless it was absolutely essential, we would not want to proceed with one of those procedures if somebody was positive. So um, there's that. Um, and there is... Um, uh, you know, a level, uh, knowing if somebody going into hospital uh, would need to be isolated is important as well. Um, so uh, we are always looking, when we, we've talked about testing previously, we talk about looking at vulnerable populations with regard to testing, and certainly uh, people in hospital, people in long-term care are vulnerable populations. So we want to do uh, what we can to help protect those uh, uh, environments and those people. Our next questions are from Kellyanne Roberts of NTV News. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm also wondering about the class action lawsuit. Now that there are two legal actions on your hands, are you concerned? You know, we will. There will be, you know, arguments that will be made. Of course, you know, people, you know, have the right, and so they should, to be able to actually. Uh, you know, file those claims. So these claims are there. Uh, but, you know, from a, a public health safety, uh, from the public health measures that have been put in place, you know, we recognize they've been put in place for a reason, as difficult as those decisions would be. Uh, what we've seen is similar in similar pr in provinces have taken similar measures. And this was put in place, you know, to make sure that uh, travelers entering to our province, that is traveling being, you know, the in, in all likelihood being the... Uh, most likely case of a cause of bringing COVID into our province. These are decisions that was been made with the evidence and advice from public health and safety. So this was really about protecting Newfoundlanders and Labradorians and preventing, you know, cases coming in to our province of COVID. You know, if you look at some of the other extreme measures and put all this in context, we still have people that live within, you know, within a kilometer away, not being able to visit their, their uh, parents that are in a long-term care center. So, when you put it all in context of 
the measures that have been taken to protect the population as a whole. And this one put in place asking just for people just for this brief period of time where we're going through this state of emergency to consider that. You know, I've had messages of people that have lost loved ones and that they could not visit their, uh, they could not visit their family member during this period of time. So it's difficult. It's a balance that we must put in place, but it's put in place to protect Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. Thank you. Dr. Fitzgerald, I'm looking for your opinion on now that the, leader, the Liberal leadership is to begin, that could mean a snap election within the 12 months is, is needed, which could mean 200,000 plus people heading to the polls. We know the Federal Election Authority says they need a year of planning to conduct a safe election. Saskatchewan's Election Authority recommends a committee of House leaders. Uh, what is your opinion on this? Well, I mean, if 200,000 people vote in this province, that would be that would be wonderful. Um, but, uh, you know, I think there's ways that we can run elections safely within the context of COVID, and we have to look at that. Obviously, it's not a question that we've, uh, we've looked at at this moment. We're very concerned at the moment with moving through our um, alert levels, so that's what we're focusing on. But uh, should the time come and should we have to... Uh, consider that eventuality, then we'll look at it with the same public health lens that we've looked at everything else, and we will give guidance uh, for how to do that safely. And I'm sure in this day and age, we can find a way to do that. Thank you. And um, this is another question for you. Monday, I'd asked about the timeline for alert level three, and you had mentioned that um, it would depend on the results of our surveillance strategy. I'm just wondering if we have a bit more information about what that surveillance strategy looks like. So our surveillance strategy is basic is based on um, all of those things that we talked about in the beginning, you know, uh, when we talked about moving from level to level and what we would have to look at, making sure that there was control of the epidemic, that we had health care capacity both in public health and in acute care, that we had ways to control importation, that we had ways to um, make sure that outbreaks could be maintained and that the public was aware and engaged. So those are all of the things that we need to look at. So our surveillance strategy is going to be looking at all of those things. So we have numerous measures that help us to determine uh, the control of the outbreak and what that looks like. And we also have uh, things that we look at with regard to how quickly contact tracing can get done, uh, what's our bed capacity, what's our ICU capacity, those sorts of things. So all of those things go into making up our surveillance strategy and uh, no one thing will determine how we move or if we have to revert through any of our levels, it will be looking at that strategy as a whole. Thank you. Our next questions are from Tyler Dunn of VOCM News. Please go ahead. Thank you. We spoke to a local child care operator who has been in the business for 40 years, and she says child care centers are pre 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 preparing to close permanently on June 26. She says the current situation is unsustainable because many parents are choosing not to come back at this time it being impossible to exercise social distancing uh, among children, and she expects there will be outbreaks, which have been seen in other areas, if the virus does resurge in the community. Um, the government subsidy provided to parents ends on the 26th, and she says while well, that kept child care centers going, she expects things will change drastically when it comes to an end. What's your response to that, and will the subsidy be extended? So right now the plan is to uh, end the subsidy at June the 26th. So what... If we think about what we've done over the last three months, uh, we put in one of the, uh, what has been a great program and has been recognized by groups right across the country as the best child care program that we would have had anywhere in Canada. We've been provided compensation and operating grants uh, for this three month period when the centers have been empty and there's been no children there, the operators, the, the staff has been paid for. So this has been one of the best programs that have been in place and we've been doing this for the last three months. So we have in, in Newfoundland and Labrador a combination of regulated and unregulated child care programs. About 65% of them would be regulated. They get the operation grants. That will be continuing post uh, June the 26th. And now you'll be at the capacity of moving up to the 70%. And keep in mind that it's not unusual given this time of the year with school closures that uh, you know the population, the number of recipients in child care, ch children in those child care centers, that changes. There's summer, uh, summer programs that have been put in place. But the commitment that we want to make is work closely with this group, uh, having child care spaces available as we open up the, uh, our economy and people that go back to work, that having those child care spaces is uh, available is very important. 
But, you know, so right now we've had a, a real good program in place. I think everybody would have known that this is something that at some point will come to an end. These operators have been paid nearly 100% of their capacity over the last three months. So right now there will be some changes that will come on June the 26th, and we'll get back into what has been almost a combination of pre-COVID time, making sure that they gradually open up the uh, child care spaces as the economy begins to open up. Um, and, Premier, I'm wondering if there is any update on the Labrador-Quebec border following the meeting earlier this week. Yeah, so, you know, what we've agreed to do is keep the RNC there, the, Q, you know, the Quebec Police Force. They've moved out of there as, as of May the 31st, so we've agreed now that given where we are with uh, – with the travel you know, conditions and restrictions that we have in place, it's important that we keep a presence at all our borders. And right now, uh, there will be the RNC will be back there on a 24-hour basis. There's some support there from public health as well. And this will be the case for all our points of entry into Newfoundland and Labrador, including Labrador South, you know, the Port of Bast and, and Marine Atlantic, as, and including our airports. So it's important we keep a presence at all our points of entry. Thank you. Our next questions are from Patrick Butler of Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Sounds like I want to ask another question about this uh, this second lawsuit uh, regarding uh, seasonal uh, uh, residents. Um, it, it sounds like we're probably going to end up going to court for this one as well. Um, that sets the province up to potentially to pay damages. Uh, are you worried about that and, and the, you know, the financial impact of uh, these measures, uh, given that we now have these, these two suits that have been filed? Well, any time you're looking at you know, costs to the provincial government, these are always concerns of ours. But primarily, the big concern for us is stopping the spread of COVID within our province. You know, let's be, you know, we must be very clear about this, is that we have seen outbreaks in provinces, you know, typically... Uh, that have been travel related so it was important for us right now as we're still living with covid in our, in our uh, in our province you know we know that this can easily come in this can easily impact a large group of people we've seen that we've seen that just in recent days so simply because we've done a really good job in newfoundland and labrador uh, slowing and stopping the spread of COVID does not necessarily mean that you cannot have a an outbreak into the future. So as we work our way through our alert level, it's important that we put those conditions in place. It's important that we be, remain patient. And as I said earlier, this is not a position that we'd like to see our province in, but this is, these are measures that have been put in place to protect the general population of Newfoundland and Labrador. I guess there's a follow-up on that. Part of the criticism coming from uh, seasonal residents is that the conditions to which you're, you're referring um, are in place in some cases, but not in others. So I, I guess, you know, for someone who is in that situation, who's being denied entry, you know, what do you say to them when, when, they're, com when they're comparing, uh, say, a worker working at a camp in, in Port McMurray who comes home and self-isolates and a seasonal resident? Who said that they would? Who says that they would do the same thing if they were to come to the province? Put themselves automatically in 14 days of, of quarantine, uh, and uh, and create a, an environment where they're not, to the best of their ability, um, uh, propagating the virus. You know, I think one thing we need to consider is that these are secondary residents for some people, and it is difficult. I mean, it's, these are people that I know and and that we all know. We can all give examples of when we live in our province of people that we know that would come into in many communities in Newfoundland and Labrador that have bought property there. So all we're asking right now is for this particular summer, for this particular point in time, we'll see where this goes, you know, into the future, you know, where we will be. Anyone that's coming into or would like to visit Newfoundland and Labrador, there is a, a process through the exemption orders that you can actually write in that would be analyzed and the work would be done for those that would want to visit our province. So if the, if the decision is there or the argument is made that this is the various reasons or the reasons that they would want to come into our province, that, uh, that provision is there. That's what's happening in PEI right now. So if you own a, a property in PEI, my understanding is you would uh, file for an exemption order. You would go in, and whether you'd be allowed to come and visit that property, that's, you know, that's, a, that's a provision that are put in place. So right now we're just asking for people that have those secondary residents and want to come to Newfoundland and Labrador. We thank you for wanting to come, but we're asking people to exercise a bit of patience during through this difficult time. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, the $30 million envelope for uh, residential construction that was announced today. 
the construction sector can continue operating during COVID-19, but there were $30 million announced for today. When you look at another sector uh, that's been you know, relatively decimated by uh, uh, COVID-19, the tourism sector, there's been just $25 million um, allocated as a, as a sort of uh, funding package for that sector. How do you explain that difference, given the differences between those two uh, parts of the economy? One of the things I think you need to consider are the complementary packages that are available, say, for the tourism industry. There is a number of federal supports that can support many of the operators uh, in the tourism industry. What we're supporting with the renovation uh, rebate that we've put in place today are, are many people now that are, are skilled workers. They, they, they work with small companies, they're renovation companies, could be large companies as well. And this is a way just to stimulate that part of the economy the economy as well. So many of them have been displaced, and the tourism sector, as we said, and uh, have we said already, the $25 million that we put in place there is complementary to many of the federal programs, to either ACOA or many of the development associations that we would see without our province. On top of that, there are federal programs that were available as well. So that's a full suite of, uh, of programs that are available there to help the tourism industry, as well as a staycation program that we'll be actually supporting as well. The, reno the renovation rebate is separate to that, and this is about property that people would want to uh, spend and invest some of their money in. And on a $40,000 expenditure, they would get 10000 back. Our next questions are from Alex Bill of All Newfoundland Labrador. Please go ahead. Uh, we're looking to find out where the status is of contact tracing in the province today. Uh, is the province closer to developing or releasing a contact tracing app? And is that something you're doing on your own or in concert with other provinces in Ottawa? So right now there's the, a, uh, uh, yeah go ahead uh, sorry premier yeah I'll just be very quick and you can fill in some blanks after so you know right now there's a national discussions that's happening around apps and technology to support contact tracing you know for uh, you know from the work that's been done uh, the, this could be a very important component but it would be one tool that's in that toolbox uh, at this point it's very difficult to see any mechanism that would actually replace some of the great work that's been done with contact tracing and we have some in our province we can be very proud that we have some of the best that we would have seen in this country and that was very clear as we dealt with the calls funeral home event so right now as technology would support those contact tracer tracing that's in place right now in all our regional health authorities that has been the focus if you speak to companies like Verifin, who's been doing a lot of work in this, you know, where they see their best results would be through programming that would actually support contact tracing. And they can do some extraordinary work. They're globally known, and they've done some very good work into security in financial institutions. And it's very, very interesting to see the parallel as we bring this into uh, tracing people who could potentially be impacted by, uh, by COVID. So, John, I'm sure you have some comments to be able to expand on that a little bit. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I mean, I think if you look at conventional contact tracing and calls, we got over 90% of contacts identified uh, within a, a reasonable period of time to the most three days. And if you listen to Dr. Rahman's comments, uh, the way to control an epidemic is to uh, at least get 60 or 70% done within 48 hours. So Don Fitzgerald's team um, uh, have uh, really broke the back of that one. Um, the advantages of contact tracing apps are um, uh, up for grabs uh, simply because the penetration that you require uh, is uh, said to be 60 to 70 percent. And even in places like Singapore and Korea, where technology is much more pervasive than it is in Newfoundland and Labrador, they only manage the best 40 percent. So um, the, the real value add from some of the work that's being done at the back end of contact tracing is around data analytics and using multiple sources of data to augment uh, the contact tracing piece. Uh, and we have some of the world's best expertise here. Uh, there's not much difference, as Verifin said, between tracking uh, an infection uh, as tracking dodgy investments. So uh, I think um, that's going to be a really exciting piece coming out soon. Okay. So if I'm, if I'm understanding you, it's more likely that we're going to see companies work with the province on data analytics for the contact tracing we currently have rather than bringing in uh, an app for individuals to use. What we're looking for I is think we use the expertise that we have available to be most effective and now we can support each other. As I said, you know, having 
And as uh, the minister has said, having the, the app in place, you know, we must be able to get to a significant mass of people that would have that ability on a smartphone that they would travel with them. And it must be working, of course. But what we do know is based on the experience that others would have had in other in other areas, and as the minister just mentioned about Verifin and their work with, with financial institutions. So we know that, that some of that knowledge can be transferred into contact tracing. And you're right, having that program available so that we can actually quick to and get to uh, uh, get there quickly, but also what was interesting is to be able to prioritize who they actually call first. So all of these are important pieces, but they all complement each other in the contact tracing world. I'm sorry, Mr. Haggy, were you following up on that as well? No, uh, the ground's been covered. Thank you. Um, okay, so the last follow-up would be, uh, you've both mentioned Verifin, and we've reported their involvement on this. Uh, is the province and the health authority uh, working with other companies on contact tracing currently? Uh, I understand Conduit in Manitoba has reached out. Uh, can you provide the names of other firms that might be working with the province? I wouldn't have the names of any uh, companies that we're working on. All I know is that the federal government and other provinces are working very closely on what would be an app, what that would look like. And, you know, Verifin is a group that has been well known in Newfoundland and Labrador and has had a lot of success in, in other spaces and can, uh, can support what would need to be done here. They are also working, by the way, you know, with the federal government as well. So all of this is really a lot of work that's being done. A lot of the work is being shared one province to another province and with the national government as well. So this is really about bringing a process in place to how we use evidence, how we use the best applications, the best programs to support what, has, what is already a very good and sophisticated contract, a contact tracing network. Thank you. Our next questions are from Peter Cowan of CBC News. Please go ahead. Uh, I don't know if this is a question that uh, Minister Hagee or uh, Dr. Fitzgerald wants to take, but uh, it sounds like as of Monday, staycations are going to be allowed now that you're no longer recommending only essential travel within the province. I'm wondering if you can give us an idea of, as people are trying to decide what they should be booking this summer, um, what are some of the best practices that you're encouraging in terms of the sort of vacations that people should be considering? You know, for example, if someone says, oh, great, I, I want to go visit some relatives on the other side of the province, is that something they should be doing right now? So I think you need to consider, um, you know, a whole bunch of things, but uh, all those basic uh, public health measures that we talk about, those personal public health measures, so, um, you know, maintain physical distancing if you can't put on a mask, um, make sure that uh, you don't go out if you're not feeling well, uh, that you try to stay or not, you do stay within your bubble, um, and that you uh, keep those close contacts outside of your bubble as, as low as you can. And, uh, you know, you have to think about, uh, so you have to think about that in terms of what types of activities you're going to be doing. So if you're going to be doing something where you know that you're going to end up likely in close quarters uh, inside for a certain period of time, uh, you know, then you might want to think twice about something like that as opposed to being outside where you can be adequately, adequately spaced. Um, you know, I've said it before, we want you to think about people, space, time, place, right? So the fewer people as possible that you can come into contact with outside of your bubble, um, enough space so that you can physically distance, keep the amount of time that you're in contact with people outside of your bubble as low as you can, and then uh, outside activities are safer than inside activities. So those are all things that you need to consider. But then the other thing you want to think about is where are you going when you're visiting someone? So are you going to be visiting somebody who may have uh, some health problems that, uh, you know, you might need to consider um, protecting them? So, um maybe not everybody in the family goes maybe just one person goes if they really need some support and some help um and you know you need to think about the ways that you're doing that safely are you going to an area um you know where there's a risk for introduction of uh, um, disease into that area should you become sick you know you need to think about all of those those things when you're planning your vacations We've heard uh, recommendations, you were just talking about there, about going outside, doing outside activities. We've seen the national parks this week now have a lot of their hiking trails, for example, are open. Why aren't provincial parks open for hiking as well? 
So we're working on a plan now with the provincial park, ne uh, park network. We, as you know, Peter, we have some great provincial parks, and as people move around the province as well, we're looking for ways now, working with the Department of uh, Tourism, Culture, and Industry and Innovation, you know, to put in those plans that will work in a very safe way that will provide people with a very good experience. And so right now, this work is is that's being uh, ongoing. That's being um, ongoing now within the uh, particular department. And my last question is for the Premier. I, I want to get you to elaborate on some of the comments you made in the introduction talking about working from home. After your comments uh, on, during the Monday's briefing, I've heard from dozens of parents who've talked about the challenges and the struggles that they've had in trying to both work from home and look after children. Why are they being told by child care centers that even as of Monday, they can't put their child back in daycare as long as they're still able to work from home? Well, right now, with the child care centers open, and the so this, if we go back to this, it was about just over a thousand people, I think, that would participated in the two hundred dollar a week uh, for essential worker program. So there's two components of this: the essential worker program. We wanted to make sure that if you're a health care worker, an essential worker in Newfoundland and Labrador, very early on into this, that having available child care spaces was not something that was restricting you from going to work. We needed them. We wanted them to go to work. That program was, was a great program. As a matter of fact, uh, not a lot of those, of those people that took a, a opportunity of that program, took advantage of that program, used the regulated child care spaces. Very few actually did. Most of them found uh, room within their, within their family network to be able to do that. That was in alert level, well, even before alert level five. But as we started to open up our province, move from one alert level to another, alert level four, we went to 50% uh, of child care spaces being open, still continued on with the 200 a week for essential workers. Now we're moving into alert level three. It goes to 70%. Schools are closed. And so right now that as people work from home, uh, you know, if, if you were pre-COVID, people would have left their home and went to work within let's say, in Confederation Building. So it was about the location of where you provide it and where you work. So if you were working in Confederation Building, then you would have needed to be able to provide child care spaces for those same children today. So right now it's about the location where you're working. Many people are working from home, and they can actually uh, support the children as the best way they can as well. We know it's difficult, and but yet... If you think of pre-COVID, these same people were working and needed to provide child care spaces because they were working out of that home setting. Now they're working home, and we've opened up the child care spaces to some 70% of those people. Thank you, Premier. We'll now take three quick questions. Uh, operator, please identify the reporter when they press star one. Thank you. The um, sourcing of PPE, has, uh, has, are you aware of any uh, recent developments in how that's being sourced? From the point of view of PPE, Peter, we have um, a steady trickle from both our usual sources and through uh, federal. Uh, we have, uh, depending on the particular item you look at, anywhere from one to more than 30 weeks of some items. Uh, so we are matching what we use with what we get. The bottom line, though, is still that the bulk orders that we had placed back in January have still not been delivered. Uh, and we burn through, you know, 3,000 items a day in some categories. So it, it is a concern as we try and do more in the way of planned and scheduled procedures that we don't run ourselves into a situation where we don't have sufficient. But at the moment, it, it, it's balancing. So as long as that's the case, uh, then we can continue down this road. At some point, we are really keen to try and build off a stock against the next wave. Uh, and we're still waiting uh, on Health Canada to do some certification uh, uh, work with uh, our homegrown um, uh, manufacturers who would certainly be able to take some of the edge off that, although I'm not even sure whether the capacity locally exists to meet all our demands. It would certainly make a big difference. Thank you. Our next question.
Operator, do we have any further questions? Yes, from Peter Cowan. Please go ahead. Dr. Fitzgerald, I want to ask about one of the changes you made last week for workers who are flying back and forth. It, when they're under isolation, they can go for a walk. Uh, you said there's a very low risk uh, of transmission there. Why not allow anyone who's under isolation to go for a walk if the risk is very low? Um, so some of the people that are under isolation are there because of um, federal um, laws, and so we can't interfere with that. So um, that has to continue. Um, I think... For Right now, what uh, we wanted to do, we'd heard that, you know, uh, the hardship of not being able to get outside or not being able to leave their property and uh, not being able to interact with people in their family was, uh, in their immediate family, was difficult for some of those workers. So we wanted to ease some of those restrictions. We still feel that staying on your property is the safest thing and the uh, lowest risk for people coming from outside of the province. So, uh, but we felt that in this group, we were we were striking a balance between um, the individual um, health and uh, mental health uh, and and public safety. So. Um, that's why we made that decision. Thank you. And our final question today is from? Patrick Butler for Glasgow, Canada. Please go ahead. Mr. Butler, your line is open. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, thanks. Uh, <laughs> Premier, tomorrow we're supposed to have a financial or fiscal update. Uh, can you give any details about uh, what's on the horizon there? Uh, we know that there's been a lot of difficulties uh, uh, in terms of uh, economically for the province. Can you, can you give us any uh, insight of, about uh, what's to be announced? Well, we know that you know we were prepared as part of the budget process. Quite a this, quite a bit of this work was done, and we were literally about two weeks, two to three weeks left in the finalization, you know, into March the 31st. So, you know, the numbers changed considerably. There's there's no question it was a, a difficult year for the province. And without getting into the, the specific details, I'll let the Minister of, of Finance deliver that news to the province. But it's been a tough year uh, for Newfoundland and Labrador. And leading now, coming out of this pandemic, there's been, without question, there's been a lot of pressure and a lot of stress put on the revenue generation. Uh, for Newfoundland and Labrador, we've been able to hold our uh, our expense line. You know, we've done a good job in managing that, but it's the revenue that has been decreased dramatically. But the specifics and uh, the numbers they will be released tomorrow by the Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, Premier. The time for questions has ended. Please join us again on Friday, June fifth, at two p.m., one thirty, in Moses of Labrador. Have a great evening, everyone. <laughs>